Hello, my friends. Greg Kokel here. Glad to be with you today on Stand to Reason. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you here. Lines are beginning to light up. That's a good sign. On anything in the area of ethics, values, and religion that's on your mind, uh, my goal, of course, to stand to reason for classical Christianity, classical Christian values, uh, demonstrating that uh, the worldview of Jesus of Nazareth, commonly known as Christianity, um, can stand to reason, can compete in the marketplace of ideas. And so that's what I hope to show. Uh, my goal here is to give you peace of my mind, and uh, that's all I ask of you. All right? Uh, so if you're inclined to give a call and want to chat with me, you're welcome to do so. You have to call during the live show, which is on Tuesday nights from 3 until 7. Um, and the number there is 855-243-9975. Nice to see did I say it wrong? Four until seven. See, <laughs> nice to see you back, Tom. We missed you the last couple of weeks. Tom had a had a baby. Well, his wife had a baby, and that means they were both out of commission because they got lots of babies over there. But now he's on board just in time to remind me that I got my numbers wrong again. Four until seven. <laughs> yeah, three not three hours is plenty. Thank you, Thomas. Four until seven, Los Angeles time. So do your numbers and give us a call on Tuesday if you'd like to uh, to chat with me uh, about anything on your mind in the area of ethics, values, and religion. Uh, last, uh, let's say, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago now, I was in Poland doing some uh, work there with a fabulous group of people. And I talked about that in the past, but I wanted to relate a conversation to you that I had during one of my classes. I think I was teaching on tactics. And in this particular event, they they want the presenters to leave lots of opportunity for interactive discussion um, towards the end of each each hour, basically. So 15, 20 minutes is given to interaction, and you never know what's going to happen, what kind of issues are going to come up, even though I'm making my case training regarding maneuvering tactically in conversations. People can bring up all kinds of different things, and in this particular conversation. Remember, I'm speaking for the most part with Europeans um, who are are even more deeply influenced by a naturalistic, materialistic way of thinking than we are in the States. And when I say even more deeply influenced, I'm talking about uh, Christians as well. Um, indeed, even myself, I would say, being someone raised in Western civilization that has a deeply materialistic bias that is a bias towards believing uh, in physical things, but not believing characteristically as a culture in non-physical things. Now, I need to qualify that. Materialism is the philosophy of the, of the academic elite um, in our country. Most people are not materialists. We know better than that. We know that non-material things exist and there are a whole host of these things, including souls and God and spirits of different types and ideas and sensations and um, thoughts and the, the beliefs, acts of will. These are all immaterial realities that we experience every day. What I mean to say is even though I, along with many others, affirm the existence of these things as part of our worldview, we are still influenced by our materialistic culture, which means it's harder for, I think, Americans to trust God to intervene in prayer for a healing than it is for Christians, say, in India uh, or Thailand or somewhere like that, some third world or, shall we say, developing world um, country where there is a much richer cultural commitment to the existence of immaterial realities. They're more culturally fit for believing those kinds of things than we are. And so not surprisingly then, when I'm in Poland working with uh, Christian leaders uh, from Western Europe, helping to train them, that they are going to be pushing back sometimes impulsively with materialistic convictions, even though they are not, strictly speaking, materialists. And this happened when somehow in conversation the issue of abortion came up. And... Um, Again, I wish I could remember what the lead-in was, but I began to get pushback from this conferee in a way that surprised me a bit. 
um, because the pushback, as I'll describe it in a few minutes, regarding my defense of the pro-life view against abortion entails, of course, my defense, that abortion is wrong because it takes the life of an innocent human being without proper justification, and virtually no justification for abortion is adequate. Whatever justification is not adequate to kill a two-year-old is not adequate to kill a child inside the womb, in my view. Uh, But, of course, this, I guess, presumes a certain understanding of what it means to be human. Now, I trade on, on this way of arguing regarding the abortion question because I think most people, uh, at least when they're not trying to defend their own philosophical turf and their own views about abortion, if they're just simply, uh, if the question is simply put to them, do you think it's wrong to kill innocent human beings and then offer some of the reasons that people give for abortion, I think most people are going to say, yes, that's wrong. And so I'm trading on that national natural instinct, and I'm just trying to show that there is real no, really no substantive difference, no morally relevant difference between a newborn or a two-year-old and one that is not quite, not yet born, but developing in the womb. And anyway, so it's this line of thinking that I'm prosecuting here, or trying to lay out quickly in response so the students can get a sense of where I'm going. Those of you familiar with Standard Reason's material on the abortion question, you know how this works. Um, What is the unborn is the basic question. And if the unborn is a human being, then no justification for abortion is adequate. If it's not a human being, no justification is necessary. But if the unborn turns out to be a human being, well then, no justification, and none that are normally given for elective abortion, seems to be adequate because we don't kill innocent human beings for because we have freedom of choice or privacy or any of those other things. Uh, anyway, that's that's the basic line I was offering, line of reasoning, that is, not line of baloney, but line of reasoning that I was offering, and somebody began to push back almost immediately. I mean, they almost came out of their chair raising their hand. And I, and I knew as I'm listening, I was surprised to hear this because I know the person was a deeply committed Christian, but I knew that what I was hearing was the physicalist way of viewing these things. And I never expected to hear that from a thoughtful Christian. And in fact, at first I thought he was just playing the other side, uh, or at least I was tempted to think that, but after a few moments I realized he was so vigorous about this that that he was really advancing his own views. Um, What I had said was that there is something growing inside of a pregnant woman. And we know the pregnant woman, the thing inside the pregnant woman, is not the pregnant woman. That is, the thing growing is not her. It's inside her, but it's not the same as her. And how do we know that? Because DNA analysis demonstrates that there is a different, unique fingerprint of that organism from the mother. Each have human DNA, so we know the thing growing is human, but their DNA is distinct from each other, so we know it's not the mother's body. It's some other body, human body, growing inside of mom, and that's the basic line there. So we know that the thing that is alive, it's growing, and the thing that's alive is human, and the human thing that's alive inside mom is not mom. Now, this is just straight-ahead science. But when I mentioned the DNA blueprint and fingerprint, immediately I got pushback um, from this from this student. When I say student, I don't mean like a teenager. He's an adult, but he was a student here at the conference. And, and he said he, he took exception with me identifying... Um, DNA with the human being because DNA is simply the blueprint and it's not the building. Mr. Coakley, you're making a mistake. You're mistaking the blueprint for the building. Then he pointed out that the zygote um, and embryo stages were just like the early stages of a building. So you lay the foundation, then you put the framing up, and then you put the walls on, you do the electrical, and on and on and on you go until you finally get the building. Before that, it's not the building. It is, (laughs) 
How can I? It is the building of the building. All right. But it, the building of the building does not result in a building until the building is completed. Keep your verbs and nouns separate there, or else you'll get confused. Um, now, at this point, I pointed out that the metaphor he was using was not parallel with reality. And a lot of times, metaphors that people use or illustrations or whatever, um, m- though may be helpful for clarifying some things, at other points, they, they lose their value because they cease to be parallel in appropriate ways with the thing that you're describing. And, uh, and I said, because unlike a merely physical thing, living beings are holy themselves from the outset. And when you think of a building, a building does not become a building just when you lay a foundation. It doesn't become a building, it seems, and even when you put the walls up. Uh, because a building is not a building until all the parts are there to make the whole. But in the case of a living thing, a living thing is a whole thing the moment it be- comes into existence, and it doesn't become something else. It is always itself completely, even though it goes through different stages of development. And so we could have zygote stage, we could have embryo stage, we can have newborn stage, we can have child stage, we could have adolescent stage, we could have young adult, we could have adult, we have middle age, we have... Notice that these are all stages of the development of the same thing. And really, even the demarcations of those uh, stages are somewhat arbitrary. That is, we're calling this a zygote until a certain day of development, and after that we choose to call it an embryo. But nothing significant changes from the last day this, uh, this human being in development is a zygote and the first day this human being in development is an embryo. It's just a continuum of transformation physically of the same thing. Um, and, and this was the point that I was trying to get, get him to see. I wasn't asserting that the DNA was the human being. I was trying to explain that we know that the thing, the whole living thing inside mom, is a human thing distinct from mom in virtue of the DNA marker. I wasn't equating the DNA, that is the blueprint, with the building. I was making the point that if you want to use the metaphor building to describe the whole human being in the womb, it is the DNA that identifies what kind of building it is. That would be a human building. But see, he was having none of this. He, he kept pushing back on this. And so, all right, um, in Colombo style, since I was teaching on tactics, I asked them this question. Were you ever an unborn child? Now, this is a very important question. Were you ever an unborn child? And you see what I'm getting at here. I'm trying to get at the sense of unity through time that, that, that living things have, even though there is change in the physical appearance. Even though you weren't big like you are now, you presumably were small then. I mean, I guess I'm kind of answering my question here for him. But was that you in your mother's womb? And he... he He first asked for clarification. What do you mean by that? Now, I think he did that because this is a class on tactics, and I just taught him to ask that. But there wasn't the slightest bit of ambiguity in my question. Nice try. Doesn't apply here. You know what I mean. Were you ever the child your mother carried whose name, uh, who was given your name on the day that you count as your birthday? Was that you? Was that someone else? Was that a potential you? Was that uh, a possible you? Or was that you? Now, he balked at this point because he said, well, the self consists of self-consciousness, and he was not conscious of himself as a self when he was born. Uh, He wasn't capable of having memories at that time. Therefore, he did not exist. 
I'm not kidding you. This is what he said. And I, and of course, then it wasn't him in the womb. And so the simple answer to the question, were you ever an unborn child, is no. To which I responded, that's ridiculous. Now, you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound like a Colombo question to me. You're right. Sometimes, and I wasn't being mean, I was just, sometimes you just have to say the obvious thing that's not particularly clever. You got to be careful you're not mean about it. But I'm standing there in front of this group of people, students, and this man is saying ridiculous things. And sometimes you just got to say, the emperor has no clothes. That's ridiculous. And um, sometimes physicalists, or, or those that at least are thinking or talking like physicalists, are so taken with their mental machinations that they cannot see the nonsense of their words when, when they're still ringing in their own ears. I told them my first memory was when I was two years old. On my second birthday, uh, I was uh, in the driveway of Lester somebody in Anago, Wisconsin. He was my dad's boss, backed out with the pickup truck, banged into me in the hip, broke my leg. My second birthday, my first memory. Who was it that bore my name before that first memory? Who, who was that running around for those first two years on his view? Who or what was in my mother's womb that was born on June 10th, 1950, and that who bore my name for two years until I, gained, I became myself with my first memory? You see how silly that is. Um... Look, completely physical things are assembled in parts, and they are only completed when all the parts are there in the right order. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, that the whole notion of any physical thing being completed depends on a certain intention for those parts when they're assembled. If there is no intention, then you can never say they're completed. They're just in a different form. The notion of anything being whole or complete entails the, the, the notion of intention, it seems to me, of a purpose for that in which one puts the final piece, which, is the, which simply means the last piece that is necessary for the intention for that thing to be fulfilled. Even with that kind of language, you can't avoid, even with physical things being completed, you can't avoid design language. But in any event, living things aren't like that. They're whole and complete selves throughout their entire existence. And regardless of the age or the form or the name that we give them at different stages, those are arbitrary distinctions, zygote, fetus, newborn, etc. These are not different things. These are different stages of development of the same thing. And, and as I mentioned, even the precise distinction of those stages is something we impose on them, they are not inherent to the living thing. Now, living things are fundamentally, metaphysically different from non-living things. They are not merely aggregations of physical parts. They are unified selves that remain themselves throughout the process of physical change, which, by the way, is ultimately going to be an argument for the soul, since nothing else can ground personal identity through physical change over time, certainly not memories. Your body's changing. I was challenged by a college student once in a Q&A at a university where I was speaking on a related topic, and he challenged my understanding of the soul and the existence, and I said, listen, uh, how old are you? Or when were you born is what I asked. He gave me his birth date. I said, the body you have right now, is that the same body that you had when you were born on that birth date? No, it wasn't, obviously. Well, if you were born on your birth date and your body that you have now was not the same body you had then, then you are not your body, are you? Now, we had nothing to say to that because it's a very straightforward line of thinking. We are aware of the unity of ourselves over time, even though our physical body is changing. So what is it that is not changing that unifies our identity over physical change? It is our immaterial selves 
that turn out to be the only things that we're aware of every single waking moment of our lives. Uh, That's how obvious the existence of the soul is. And um, look at uh, he, the, the gentleman mentioned something about twinning as like evidence against my view. It can't be a human being there because it can twin. Well, that doesn't so, that doesn't prove anything. All it proves is that a genuine human being can twin, can divide and become two separate human beings. What well, what's the problem there? In any event, uh, afterwards I did talk to some people. I wanted to get some feedback, partly because the conversation got a little bit, I don't know if intense is the right word, but it certainly was charged. I tried to keep my man, hope, uh, my manners, and he did as well, though it was still charged. So I wanted to double-check, did I do something wrong? I step out of bounds. I asked a couple of people. One person actually thought that I had set this whole thing up, that he was a plant, uh, so I could use him as an example of the tactical approach because the person in the class who listened to the whole thing thought it was a great example of what I had been teaching, but it wasn't a plan. Um, I followed my tactical game plan, but uh, that was a real story, which shows how much we can be influenced by our cultural ethos even when we have a worldview that dictates otherwise. Anyway, to your calls in just a moment, I'm Greg Kokel on Stand to Reason. Each of us as Christian ambassadors faces two daunting challenges when trying to make a difference for Christ. First, how do we initiate conversations about spiritual things in a way that doesn't seem awkward? Second, how do we keep ourselves from getting trapped or overwhelmed by others more aggressive than we are? Well, that's what Greg Kokel can teach you in his book and DVD curriculum on tactics. Greg will teach you how to maneuver in conversations so you can create more productive dialogue with skeptics and challengers. Tactics are practical skills that Greg gives names like Columbo, Suicide, Steamroller, Rhodes Scholar, and more. Tactics are a way of engaging others effectively and winsomely, no matter what the subject. If you're tired of finding yourself flat-footed and intimidated in conversations about what you believe, if you want to increase your confidence and your skill in discussions no matter who you're talking to, then Tactics is for you. Order Tactics in book, DVD, CD, or MP3 format at STR's online store at str.org. Or simply give us a call at 800-2-REASON. That's Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. All right, friends, Greg Kokel here giving you a piece of my mind, as I do every Tuesday from 4 till 7. Tom had to run that spot just to kind of correct the numbers and make sure nobody was confused. All right, great. Let's uh, let's start taking calls. Here we have an anonymous caller from an, an anonymous uh, location. Uh, glad you called. I don't know what do we call you, Bill or Phil? You, you can call me Bill if okay. you'd like. All right, Bill. I'm glad you called. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much. Well, Greg, I, I want to just thank you so much for your ministry. I found out about you through the White Horse Inn, which is also played a huge part in my life. And oh, great. I just read Tactics last month, and it was a huge breath of fresh air mm. to me personally, and I've been uh, consuming a lot of the podcast, and it's just been very, very helpful. I great. just can't thank you enough for what Stand the Reason is doing. Mm-hmm. Well, I I am a photographer, and um, I'm in the wedding industry, mm-hmm. and... I, I I love when you talk about not having to do more work than you have to do, but I find myself um, with uh, inquiries of same-sex marriages mm-hmm. wondering the best way to approach turning it down or saying that I'm unavailable or just how do I, I, I feel like, my hand is forced so quickly mm-hmm. on the situation with people that I don't know, with people that are calling me blind. And I've been able to, it's, it's interesting, I've been, some people have called and I've already been booked, so I've been able to say I'm booked. Mm-hmm. Some people I've been able just to say I'm unavailable, and that's been fine. Mm-hmm. But just last month I was asked point blank, hey, I'm having um, my gay marriage, will you document it? 
And Mm -hmm. I told him, I said, um, well, I don't personally um, agree with this, and therefore I don't think I'm the best fit for you because I think that you should probably have someone Mm -hmm. who supports this um, this celebration. It's not fair to you. They're paying you a lot of money to Mm -hmm. not, and it's a very personal thing. Um, And I can recommend some people to you, so I think we'll be okay doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, I hung up the phone. I had no idea if Twitter was going to explode, and all of a sudden I'm shut down. It's just a huge market gift. I mean, it's hard, too, because most of my clientele is very wealthy, very um, educated, very liberal. And even if it was just, you know, I know a lot of people are worried about, you know, will it force you to do it? I think by me, just people knowing that I don't do it, I think uh-huh. it's going to be a huge mark against me. Right. And I also take great um, kind of, uh, I guess, peace in what you said that, in what you have said, that we are not assured persecution and it's coming. So mm-hmm. I don't know how much of this is me just needing to say, like, this is yeah. persecution versus being wise. Right. And, Hey, uh, using tactics in the situation. Mm-hmm. So, Bill, there's one little piece that I missed because there's you're you're you breaking up just a little bit. So, okay. uh, did, you said something about Twitter. So, you told the person that you well, don't think you're the best fit for them because of uh, this is a celebration and you're not celebrating with them basically. So, maybe right. it'd be better to find somebody that that really was comfortable in that environment. And did right. you say then it went on no, Twitter? I said I didn't know if I would hang up the phone and see this guy tweeting out that this yeah. company refuses to do this, which I, it is happening. I yeah. mean, I was fortunate in that he did not do that, but I know that my days are probably numbered for kind of staying um, below the surface on where I stand with this issue. Uh-huh. So I don't, I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll respect you so much, and uh-huh. I'm curious if there's any tactical way of, of engaging this question when your hand is forced so quickly um, with mm-hmm. people that you don't know in, a, in an issue that I would rather not be the issue that right. I'm fine by, but I, I apparently don't have a choice over this. So You know what? Uh, thank you for calling, uh, first of all, Bill, and also for flattering me with your request. Um, that I would maybe be able to offer something. I, I actually, I have some thoughts that I want to give you, but as we're talking, I'm jotting some things down that you have said that I think are actually rather clever given what you're faced with, and maybe a combination of things might be helpful at this point. You said okay. something about, you, there you put on the spot, okay? And then you, you, um, I'm wondering... The first thing that came to my mind when you when you said that is, gee, if you're put on the spot, you're 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 put in an awkward position. And how can we sidestep this um, so that you get some breathing room? All right. Yeah. S- secondly, you and I both know that there are going to be disingenuous callers who are going to be trying to trap you. Yeah. And they don't care about getting uh, having your services. In fact, they may not even uh, have any any wedding whatever in mind they are just putting this to you and who knows if they're taping or whatever and then they're going to try to squeeze you and this yeah. happens by this group a lot yeah. okay so here i'm i'm just sometimes talking together about this generates something productive and so yeah. here's, here's the first thought that i have when you get somebody to call you and say will you do my same-sex ceremony or anything like that, um, the impulse is to say, now I've got to answer yes or no regarding the issue per se. But it strikes right. me you don't have to answer that. First, you could say, well, who are you? And where you're from? And what's your date? And what church you're going to be at? And what's the name of your pastor? And, and you like to get all of the relevant information down before you commit yourself. So, you're asking questions now to gather information, and um, you could say at some point, I'm going to have to get back to you and talk to you later about this. So, in your initial conversation, you can plan it 
so that you don't make any commitments of any kind, one way or another, you don't show your cards at all. Okay. Okay. All you have to say is, you know, I've got to, I, I need to follow up on this information and think about this. What if you just said that? Isn't that just delaying the inevitable in a uh, way? No, not necessarily, and I'll tell you why. It's not inevitable in my mind that this person is going to call back. Hmm. It's not inevitable. Yeah. Uh, are you married? Yes, I am married. How many ph- photographers did you contact before you? Well, you might be being in the business. You might have had just <laughs> one in mind or something like that. But yeah, I had uh, a boss. Photograph okay, well, so but isn't it normal for people to make contacts with a, especially if they're cold calling? Uh, uh, to sure. Contact a couple sure. of different photographers and find the right fit. And what what Mary, people with looking for help in that kind of way are, are looking for a fit, right? Right. We did that when we got married. We met with the woman who took our pictures. We felt she understands what we're doing, what we're about, whatever. So let's just presume this is legitimate. Yeah. The other person just touching base with you. And what yeah. he gets from you uh, he, or she, whoever gets from you, is a, a, a series of questions that are relevant to the issue and uh, and the statement you have to give it some thought. Yeah. Let me check up on these details. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, now what you haven't said is whether you're going to do it or not going to do it. You haven't committed yourself at all philosophically with regards to the moral issues, and you haven't said you're going to call back. Yeah. Okay? But what you do have is relevant information. Now, it's possible for you now to check up on this relevant information. Like, for example, Uh where are you registered for your wedding gifts? Yeah. Why should that matter? Well, because I try to find out all I can about the people who are potential clients. Then you could find out whether this person's legit or not. Yeah. Now, if they aren't legit, then there's no reason to call them back. If yeah. they call you back and you say, I have no reason to believe that this is a legitimate request, so I'm not pursuing it any further, and that's the end of that conversation. What if it is a legitimate oh, request? Okay, if, if it is a legitimate request and you delay it to another phone call, my suspicion is a whole bunch of these people are not going to call you back. So you're going to Am eliminate... Am I putting it on them to call me back? Yeah. In that sh- scenario? Sure. Well, you, you say, you know, I'm going to have to... Pers- I'm just going to have to do a little bit of uh, background checking or whatever, however you want to put it. Write it out. Yeah. Find a way to say it that sounds professional and somewhat innocuous right. but doesn't commit you. Yeah. You know, and some people are might be thinking, well, see, you're kind of playing a little game here. And my response is, you're exactly right. Yeah. We are trying to figure out how to maneuver shrewdly in the circumstance without creating any liability and without and, and trying to sidestep any difficulties for anybody. That's yeah. called blessed are the peacemakers, all right? Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that at all, Bill. So that's the first thing I'd say. F- figure out when, if, when you get a request like this, first ask a lot of information. Like you're filling out a form. Name, right. dates, church, pastors, where you're registered. I just need these details. I can't commit yet, but I need all this information. I need to follow up on this information before I commit. I think the hard thing, too, is sometimes like the person that called me was pretty straight to the point. Or do you have a problem documenting a gay wedding? Was there a question to me? I need to ask some other questions. I, I need to ask some other questions first. Yeah. There. I mean, that's my role play right there. I need to yeah. ask. I, I need to answer. I need to. I need to get some other information before I go into any of those details. Yeah. Okay. When is the wedding? Da da da. What's your name, sir? Yeah. And your partner's name. First and last, you're writing it down, and you do this. In fact, you need to have a record of that. I mean, just just archive it. Yeah. For legal reasons, who knows? I you I, you could say, look at I took all the information. I got yeah. it all here. You're you're doing due diligence. There's nothing wrong with you doing that. That yeah. can't you can't be accused of anything untoward. Do right. you do that for all your people? D- does it matter? Who cares? You know, anyway, maybe you'd want to start doing that for all your people. Maybe. I don't know. But see what you I'm just thinking I'm I'm trying to buy you some time. That's all. Okay. so here you buy yourself some time. All right. And then you just let it lie. 
if they call back, then you got to go into stage two on this one, right? And, yeah. and, and then you ask, tell me what you're looking for. And this is something you suggested to me indirectly. This is what I thought of when I heard you talking. Tell me, and I'm role-playing now, tell me what you're looking for in a photographer. Are you, are you looking for somebody that understands what this means to you, that wants to celebrate it with you, that wants to capture your excitement? I don't know. What, what are you looking for? And then you could f- let them talk a little bit. You could feed some things. And then you may be at a position to say, you know what? I probably am not the person that can give you what you're looking for. And that's kind of what you told me. Yeah. Not, I'm not the best fit. Yeah. I don't think I'm the, p- to be honest with you, you could say, I'm uncomfortable with these kinds of services. And if I'm uncomfortable with these kinds of services, I don't think I'm going to give you the best service. Mm. You're you're not going to get what you're looking for. Yeah. And so I I have never had this thought before about these things, Bill, but your just your comments early on suggested this to me. I I, I thought, well, that what Bill is saying is that sounds good. This is a nice. Do you really want me? The question isn't, do I want you? Yeah, right. The You're going to spend is, a lot of money for someone who, and my, there's a lot of people out there that would be ecstatic about this. Yes, but exactly. My heart's not going to be in this, all right? And if my heart's not in it, you're going to sense that I'm not celebrating with you, that I, I'm not on the page with you, that I'm not, you, you're just going to sense this. By the way, notice that nothing there has not been any conversation about whether you will or won't do it, right. and there hasn't been any conversation about anything that can— you're talking about your feelings, that's all. Yeah. And whether, given the feelings you have, and you know, and at this point, so far, you can't be fined for your feelings. Yeah. Now, who knows what's going to happen? You can't parody this stuff, you know. But uh, it, it, if you— we're trying to find a way to ease you out of this and let them disqualify themselves if they can. Right. Okay. So that's what you're looking for. And, uh, I'm going to be really uncomfortable. And, and then look at, maybe they're just trying to snag you and say, will you do it or won't you? Yeah. Oh, are you asking me? Then maybe you'd say, uh, are you, are you, are you asking me? Are you hiring me right now? Yeah. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> Are you well, hiring me, or are you trying to box me in? Right. Okay. And, and that's when it, I think it's fair to start getting a little bit cagey with them and say, I'm not going to be yeah. boxed into this, okay? I'm asking you what you're looking for in a photographer. Right. Okay? I'm also telling you that I all the things you described, man, I'm not comfortable with this at all. And so, therefore, my suspicion is you're not going to get what you want. Yeah. You want to hire me? Do you want to hire me? And yeah. put it that way. Again, you know, who knows how successful you're going to be here, but this is a lot better than just saying, uh, uh, uh. Well, what, what's your thought about, like, because I live in a, in a very liberal community as well. I do a lot of family sessions, and I'm, I'm really torn with, with maybe a, a same-sex family that has children that would approach me to do a family session and how I would address that. Yeah, that really I, think, I, I think you can address it the same way, in principle. Yeah. I, I don't think that you should be obliged to ply your trade in a way that you're morally uncomfortable with. I, I, it just, yeah. you, you, I mean, I, and one could imagine other circumstances we can contrive where, you know, just, you say, you know, I don't, I don't want to mess with this. It just is, I... My personal views, you can put it any way you want, but it's just my hang-up, whatever. I'm just not comfortable yeah. with this. And yeah. um, I think if you say no because I have religious objections, if you imply that, you're going to get—this is—the courts are already weighing in on these kinds of things, and they're just not going to—at least some of them are not going to uh, respect your conscience concerns. Right. So, so maybe— what, 
maybe What's if you... What's the best be, wording there? Yeah, well, I'm not sure what the best... Word, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip here now, and yeah. this is maybe what you can work with. And yeah. and, and I, I'd suggest doing this thing, just playing out this... I am, I'm really, really uncomfortable with this circumstance. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of circumstances that I might be uncomfortable with. This is one of them. And if I'm right. going to be uncomfortable with this, I'm not going to... I, I, don't, I don't expect my work is going to satisfy you. <laughs> If you say, I'm not going to do good work for you, they might say, well, see, you're choosing to do a lousy job because I'm gay. Well, that's not what you mean. Right. So the, uh, this is why I think it would be good for you to try to write some of these little scripts out so yeah. they're handy and, and, and practice them kind of in your mind or however before you get there. And if you're anticipating what you, how you might respond, then when it comes up, you can say, oh, okay, uh, and your name and the web blah, blah, and here's information. I'm going to have to think about this. All right? Yeah. All right. Let me, let me follow up on some of this data. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much for your call. Thank there you, go. Greg. Nothing, no, I, I was role-playing. I wasn't saying oh. I, I was just role-playing <laughs> right. there. Sorry, I didn't want you to hang up. I want you to see how this might play out. Um, yeah. And then you could say, well, w- wait, what's the problem? I said, well, I have to check right. your data out. I don't know. And then you could say, well, I don't know if this is a legitimate request or not. I have to check all of that out first. Right. And right. Why, so that's to, thank you very much for your call. There you go. Okay. Yeah. And then what I would do in that case is I would tr- check that out. And, and, and because if you check it out and you find out it's a phony or you could not verify the data, then you are fully within your rights when somebody calls again to say, you know what, I do, I've tried to check this out. I didn't find any of this information. Therefore, um, I, I do not um, – uh, uh, I'm not interested in even talking about doing business. And, yeah. then, and let it – if they call back. If they don't call back, you're home free. If they do call back and it's legit, that's when you go into phase two. Okay, now what's phase three? Um, I would say phase three, and this is where advice is cheap because it doesn't cost me to give you this advice, but it may cost you to carry this advice out. Um, You have to survey your own conscience, and if your conscience before the Lord says, I do not think it's right for me to serve this kind of ceremony, and keep in, you know the distinction between serving the person and serving the ceremony. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that you don't care about taking a snapshot of somebody who has uh, same-sex sexual attraction, uh, right. taking their photo. But this is something different. Yeah. And so your, your animus is not against gays since you'd serve them individually or whatever, but your animus is against a celebration of something you think is wrong, participating in that, then I think you're, th- 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 you're on a, a, a more solid ground. Now, of course, at least the courts in New Mexico did not honor the distinction I just made. And, and in, rhetorically, the other side doesn't honor it at all. They, they are, seem to be constitutionally, intellectually incapable of seeing the distinction. They just want to cry bigot, you know. Uh, right. Because they're they're bothered about this, but I, I'm just trying to think of a shrewd way to help you to step through this. Yeah. So you don't want push come to shove until push comes to shove. If you can dodge, right. if you can sidestep some way, then you do that. If if it ever comes to it's all out there, this company is a bunch of bigots. That's that's a whole nother question, I'm assuming. I, nother... I don't know that you're going to be able to do anything about that. Mm-hmm. I I don't think you're going to be able to do anything about that. You know the old yeah. saying that um, a lie gets halfway around the world before truth gets its boots on. <laughs> People can say whatever they want in the public square, and you will never retrieve it. Yeah. And that's just a sad fact of reality, and this is where, you know, you're— passage from uh from matthew chapter 5 comes into play where jesus says blessed are you when all manner of people speak ill of you for the gospel's sake great is your reward in heaven i'm paraphrasing because i don't have it right in front of me but you know the you know rejoice when people persecute you again it's, yeah. cheap. it's easy for me to give you that advice because i'm not the person who's going to lose their livelihood in some measure here but um, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Mm. And I offer you that because this is what Jesus said, and I was encouraged because I heard Bill Craig say the same thing, the Christian philosopher William Lane Craig, when someone asked him how's he deal in debates with people who are so abusive, he said, Jesus said to rejoice, and yeah. he cited this passage. So I thought, gee, duh. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so because your reward in heaven will be great. So if you have to suffer for righteousness sake, you have chosen the better portion. Thank you for that word. Okay. Well, Bill, it's a pleasure to talk with you and honor. And uh, I know Bill isn't your real name. And I hope someday, maybe after you've kind of uh, had to n- navigate some of these issues, you can call me back and tell me how it went. Maybe you'll have some suggestions for adjustments that you think will be good for other people that might benefit from that, too. I would love that, Greg. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome, Bill. All the best to you. All right, bye. Uh, yeah, bye. That was uh, that was a good call. And I, uh, it just surprises me sometimes that if I sat down to think about that, I probably wouldn't come up with much because I have thought about it before. But when you're actually engaged in conversation, iron sharpening iron, you know, things come up, and Bill offered some thoughts that were helpful to me too, and. And uh, anyway, we've got to start thinking through this because this kind of thing is going to be coming up in lots of different professions much more aggressively. And the group that we're dealing with here is litigious. They want to hurt people who disagree. All right, let's take a very quick break, and then we'll come back to Mobile, Alabama. Greg Koch will stand to reason. You can take STR with you through our apps for iPhone, Android, and iPad, available for free from iTunes or the Android market. You can listen live to STR's weekly webcast to podcast archives by all of our STR speakers, check the STR blog, and access timely and practical resources on many subjects, including the latest Solid Ground, Greg's mentoring letters, and much, much more. You'll have STR resources at your fingertips in a clean layout with great features and functionality. It's free, so download the app today through iTunes or the Android market and start carrying STR with you everywhere you take your phone. Just one more way that STR is seeking to increase your knowledge, wisdom, and character. All right, friends. Uh, Back with you here on Stand to Reason, Greg Kokel, and in Mobile, Alabama, uh, Landon. Hi there, Landon. Hi, Greg. Thanks for taking the call, bud. Sure, sure. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Um, I just had a kind of a quick question. I've been talking to a fellow about some text in the scriptures, and how do we know um, in our present time that, um, for example, the way some of the language in the New Testament is, like when Luke opens up his gospel and, and, mm-hmm. and the account of Acts, like he addresses it to Theophilus, and mm-hmm. um, when Paul writes his letters, it's to the church at Philippi. Mm-hmm. How do we know that those guys intended those letters to be read by the church at large for the continuation of the church age and that its truths would sort of, you know, carry on. So they weren't just directed specifically to those people at that time, at that place, for that reason. Right. Well, um, that, in part, you know the answer. Let Let me start by saying there's no simple answer to your question, because it kind of depends. Um, you know, in some cases, because um, the writer says, these are the things that I instruct all the churches. Or the writer says, I want this letter that I'm sending to you to be read in the other churches in the area. And I think it's okay. pretty straightforward, under, you know, common sense notion that he, if he wants other churches to read it, it's not because they just happen to be in the same general geological area, but nobody outside of that. Uh, does the does the letter pertain to? And rather, this is more what they call a general epistle. All right. In fact, that's the that's what they're called: the epistles or letter to the Romans or to the Corinthians, uh, Galatians, I should say. I guess the Corinthians, Galatians, the Hebrews. These are general epistles. Okay. They are these are written to broad, large groups of people. Okay. Um, other places, other letters are written specifically to individual congregations to reply to a specific need. 
uh, like if, say Philippi, uh, the, uh, Philippians is written to the church at Philippi, and there in chapter 3 you see a specific circumstance being addressed about a conflict between two people, Yodia and Syntyche, right. okay? Well, obviously, right. that's an individual circumstance that is meant to be addressed there. That that admonition, that true comrade, whoever that is, you know, adjudicate between these two people and settle this problem, that admonition is not an admonition to the Church for all ages. But what we, it, it, that's about that problem. But what we can see is the way Paul addresses problems. Two people are fighting. Somebody else in the church help out. That seems to me a legitimate generalization from that specific circumstance. Okay. Okay. So, so s- for for somebody, I'm sorry, real quick. This, so for somebody to make the statement that you know he didn't, the author, like, like let's say it's Paul in Philippians, he didn't intend for people, you know, throughout time to read this and draw, you know, truths and principles from it. You have to so contextualize it to that time period that it actually stops there, and and then that that's it. Well, that, if somebody a, makes that claim, I'm going to I'm going right. to ask him why would he think that that's the case. I can okay. make the case regarding that little paragraph that I just described out of Philippians because it's right. obviously applying to Yodia and Syntyche, okay? However, the broader when you read the broader letter of Philippians, you can see that what Paul is addressing there is are larger issues that pertain not just to the unique circumstances of Philippi, but to Philippians, the Philippian Christians as Christians. And insofar as it addresses them as Christians, then any Christian can benefit from what Paul told the Philippian Christians. Now, that what I just identified, though, is a judgment call. One has to look at the context and see uh, whether the things that are being said here seem to be things that apply directly to a unique set of circumstances, and therefore, as such, prima facie, just the way he's given it doesn't apply to us, like meat sacrifice to idols. We don't have that stuff no. here in our culture, but um, or not. And then, then, and if it doesn't apply, is there some larger thing in play that's evidenced by the particulars which no longer apply, but which larger thing might apply? So, I mean, these are legitimate questions of biblical interpretation. Uh, Paul was a an apostle to the Gentiles by his own admission. So when he sends letters of instruction to Gentile Christians, I have no reason to think that these don't have broader application to Gentile Christians, even though he is there addressing a specific congregation. Let me give you an example of, of this problem that I'm describing. A lot of people miss this. Jesus' final discourse was the Upper Room Discourse. This is the Last Supper. We read the details most extensively in John 13 through 17. And in the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus gives final instructions. But he is giving a a, a lot of different things there, and sometimes he seems to be talking to to um, to the disciples as believers— if I go, I prepare a place for you, and I will go and bring you back. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That that isn't just for those eleven people. That seems to be a broader thing. But when he gives other directives, and he says that the Holy Spirit will bring to you, will guide you into all truth, and bring to your remembrance everything I have taught you. Well, that sounds like he's talking to the disciples as disciples giving them an authority that you and I as followers of Christ would not have. Now, how do you know that in any given text? You just got to read carefully and come to your best judgment. And that's a passage I think a lot of Christians have misunderstood. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead us in all truth. Yeah, he wasn't talking about you. He's talking about the disciples. Because if he meant you and me, and we're differing on this, then obviously he failed. (laughs) Because we would be agreeing on this if that was for all of us. But, right, right, yeah. So, and and I think what what is just a little a little bit difficult possibly is, um, you know, for example, in First Corinthians, you know, what's mentioned with, um, 
uh, a lot of the um, ecstatic behavior from mm-hmm. the Corinthian mm-hmm. during that time Speaking period. In and tongues, there's also, right. Yeah, there's typically references to um, Delphi, the Oracle, and whatnot. Now, mm-hmm. I don't, you don't really see any of that external evidence in the text, so you have to go outside of the text That's right. in order to sort of draw the You have context. no other choice. That's correct. I'm speeding up here because we're almost out of time. I'm yes, sorry, you're right. No, no, that's all right. You're onto it, and some of this stuff takes additional study because all writing is in a context. All of those writings are in a context of a culture, and we are not in that culture anymore. We are far removed in distance and time, and consequently, we have to be careful how we read things. And that's why genre and historical circumstances and everything is so important. So it's not tidy, but it can be done. And hope that some of the things I've offered, Landon, will help you out. Okay, that's it for the hour, my friends. And more ahead, stay with us on Stand to Reason.